welcome back to another video of mine. This is another ready video. So part two to that, I just graduated from medical school series. Um, this is a, I just graduated from medical school and my list of roads led me down a bizarre hallway. Have you ever walked through a hallway where everyone knew that you didn't belong? Imagine experiencing that in your own place of work. I kept my head down and ears up as I travelled through the central corridor of, of the Children's Burn Unit of St Francis Hospital. The hospital, does, the hospital doesn't have a children's burn unit. Even though I passed a sign that proudly claimed it had been donated by, donated by the Friends of Crestwell Academy to superb children. Nope, this place didn't exist. I'd been working at St Francis since July and I knew every square inch of it. Maybe there was a wing that, that I had missed, right? But after advancing in a straight line for several minutes, I knew that this, well, I knew that was nonsense. I didn't go around any corners or find any walls. It certainly would have noticed a half mile hallway if, there, if, it, if it were real. The people were off as well. There was, there was a heavy set nurse with frizzy hair who stared with distrust as I passed. I encountered her three times different, three times along the same corridor, despite the fact that she had not possibly have moved ahead of me. Another nurse, frail and nervous looking, tried to hand me a bag of blood. When I refused, she threw it angrily on the ground where it splattered. I kept walking without looking back. My list of rules had been very clear about the fact that I was to continue in a straight line for 47 minutes if I found myself in this impossible place. I glanced down at, I glanced down at my watch. It was 3.09am, six minutes since I had arrived in this impossible corner of hell. The employees became more persistent as I walked on. Doctor, a resident yelled at me as he jumped out of the room. The patient is coding, we need you stat. I carefully avoided eye contact as I moved past him. Doctor, he screamed, you're killing her. I wiped away a tear as I continued forward, ignoring the unholy scream that came from the room. I'd heard enough patients to know what a death well sounds like, but I had no choice. A minute later, I, come ac I came across a pool of standing blood. It reached across to both hall walls of the hallway and stretched 20 feet in front of me as I watched. As I watched, I could see it growing. A surly looked man in janitor's uniform stood by, arms crossed, staring at me. I didn't think he was actually a janitor. Without slowing down, I plodded through the blood, squish, squish, squish. Dad, use my favourite pair of crocs. I entered a clear patch of hallway and checked my watch. It was 3.22. I'd been walking for 19 minutes, which was 13 longer than I'd last checked. The newfound quiet was more unearthing than the blood had been. And slowly I could feel tension growing in the air. Imagine a strange man standing two inches behind you, who can smell, who you can smell but not see, as his breath warms the back of your neck. That kind of tension was coming from the room ahead. Room ahead. Slowly the door came into view. I could see the numbers 191 before I closed my eyes. I kept them shut as I went by. Vertigo nearly sent me tumbling as I passed the door. I didn't care about the possibility of walking to a wall. I kept my eyes closed for a long time after that. Miraculously, I didn't hit anything. When I finally opened them again, it was tw it was 3.27. 24 minutes to go. That's when the hand tugged at my back. Can you please help me? Squeaked the terrified voice from behind. I stopped walking. I considered my options. Then I continued forward. Wait, he cried. Please, I'm really hurt and I need your help. He grabbed my shirt again and started crying. I wiped, both, I wiped both my eyes and moved onward. The greatest challenge makes us grow, but that feat is achieved through forcing some small parts of us to die. Children only have the energy and, and drive to play outside because the world hasn't extracted its inevitable due. I knew that I had to obey the rules, but doing so killed a little piece of my soul. I've become a doctor because I believed that I could give all of me and keep getting out of bed each day without a diminished sense of purpose. But as I listened to the child walk behind me, crying loudly and begging for help, I accepted the fact that part of me was never coming out of that godforsaken burn unit. I passed the heavy set nurse again. Her eyes bulged as she saw the boy. Doctor, she yelled, you need to help that child. I walked past without acknowledging her. Doctor, she screamed, what is wrong with you? I ignored her in the same way I dismissed all the nurses, doctors and patients who gawked at the boy in my wake. No matter what I shouted, I pretended not to hear them as I moved onward. What happened to him? Him? 
What happened to her? Why would enemies? Why would anyone ignore a child in that state? Should we help him? No, the boy is her responsibility. The tears, my, the tears wouldn't stop, no matter how many times I wiped my face. I passed a doctor and another janitor. I recognised them as, as the people who extracted Myron from the OR. They stared, arms folded, judging me as I went by. Figures, the doctor explained to the silent janitor. She wasn't there for her little brother either. I broke. I let my body double over and cried openly. Deep, ugly sobs. heaved from my diagram, convulsing my frame as my mind teetered on, on edge. But I didn't stop walking. Doctors can compartmentalise when facing issues of life and death, and my life depended on constant movement. The boy clutched my shirt as I welled, and we walked. For no less than three miles, I endured the most bizarre trial of my life. A sudden urge, a sudden change in the acoustics prompted me to look at my watch. 3.51am. 47 minutes have passed. I had one final shuddering sob, then stopped and looked around. I was in familiar territory. The first friendly face was, Lyd- was Lydia. A nurse that I knew from was her from this world. I wanted to wrap her in a bear hug and scream in delight. She stared at me, her face contorted in horror. What the F is that thing behind you? My body temperature surely dropped five degrees as I felt a familiar tugging on my shirt. I froze. Panic footsteps come rushing my way. I stared in the direction instead of looking behind me. Dr. Squirt was in full sprint. Dr. Ophelia, she yelled. She was a consummate button. That moment I wanted to see her more than anyone else on earth. It's been 47 minutes, I heaved in a shaken breath. Should I look at it? Dr. Squirt stopped a few steps away from me. Gravely, she nodded. I swallowed, then slowly turned around. I told myself that nothing is ever as bad as we picture it, because reality is not well, is bound by rules that imagination is not. I was wrong. Imagine a pizza, a pizza with the cheese stripped off, a lumpy mass of marinara, is occasionally interrupted by chunks of sizzling meat, the sit atop a mound of globby yeasty dough. Now imagine that pizza is a person, that person is a child, and one eyeball is hanging from an empty socket. And that child has no hair, because all the skin has gone from his scalp, and that he has a gaping hole where his nose should be. Help me, he whispered, help. His jaw fell to the floor, scattering teeth in every direction. The boy's tongue dangled from his open throat, flopping aimlessly like a dying fist. Then he squeezed my arm in a vice-like grip and screamed and fell to the ground. I looked down at the motionless glob of flesh that had once been a child. Dr. Squirt, I believed. Is he? Don't be an idiot, Dr. Ophelia. He was dead long before you brought him here. I stared at her in sudden realisation, like more than 120 minutes before. Did your inane chatter suddenly achieve the ability to carry a body to the morgue, Dr. Ophelia? She asked as she bent over a cop. Uh, I'll find a gurney. No signs up to be a doctor. No one signs up to be a doctor because she's afraid of getting blood on her manacle. She snapped as she lifted the boy's shoulders. Grab the damn legs and let's hope this body has more structure and integrity than Jello. This cadaver's not going to walk itself to the crematorium. Dazedly, I bent over and picked up the boy's ankles. My stomach turned as his skin shifted under my grip like the flesh of barbecue chicken. Compartmentalise. Lydia held the door open for us as we carried the boy down the stairs, through the morgue, and into the cor- corner where I had never needed to venture. I knew that the incinerator was there, but I had no reason to use it. It's too small to fit his body inside, I explained, as I gasped for air. Dr. Squirt was clearly in amazing shape. She had nearly sprinted across the morgue, and I had struggled to keep pace while hauling the body. What can we... She grunted as she snatched the corpse from me and shoved his feet inside the incinerator. If you're going to bore me to death with ridiculous conversation, Dr. Ophelia, then hurry up. Make sure I'm, over, make sure I'm dead before 120 minutes is up. Either that or effing help me. It's amazing what we're capable of doing when an imposing figure informs us that we have no choice. Side by side, we forced the boy's body into the narrow opening of the incinerator. When he got stuck, we pushed harder. Both of us groaned with effort as his charged, melting flesh sloshed off like the skin of a rotten peach. Lumps of meat dropped to the floor as we peeled layers off the boy. But he wasn't. But he was going in. We were putting the shoulders through when his eyelids opened.
Okay, that's it for this video. So, hope you guys enjoyed and goodbye.